Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And our study will more or less cover the entire chapter. We're not going to read all 58 verses. But we're going to answer a question of which Paul used to end his book of 1 Corinthians. Of course, Corinth was a church that had a lot of problems. Oftentimes, I title the book when I'm studying it or when I'm teaching it, Modern Problems in an Ancient Church. And as you run through the book, you see where they are having trouble with deciding which preacher to follow, whether it needed to be one with a Jewish background, such as Cephas or Peter, whether it needed to be one with a Gentile background, such as Paul, whether it needed to be someone with great talent and eloquence, such as Apollos. And Paul tells them in chapters 1 and 2 and 3 that they needed to focus on Christ. It's not the preacher, it's the message that is preached. And as you continue through the book of 1 Corinthians, you see where people are suing one another and somebody is living with his father's wife and there's all sorts of immorality which is going on through the book which Paul is working to correct. As you go through chapter 7, you see there's a lot of family issues and a lot of marriage issues which are going on. And as you continue through, you see where there's issues as far as even how people treat one another in church. How do you do the Lord's Supper? How, what is it that people need to do during worship? How is it that people need to worship? And as Paul ties all that together and he gets to the end of his book, he starts. Chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren. In other words, here it is. Here is what we are about. Here is what it is that we need to discuss. Now, I mentioned that 1 Corinthians is modern problems in an ancient church. Because churches today have problems. If you have people in church, you're going to have problems. And there are many people today who say, well, I'm a Christian, but there's some doctrines I prefer over others. I don't like what the Bible teaches about uh, alcoholic drinks. I don't like what the Bible teaches about how marriage is to be between one husband and one wife for life. I don't like this doctrine or that doctrine or whatever it may be. And sometimes we look at the church and we look at Scripture as a buffet. We'll take the things that we like, but we leave behind the things that we don't. Well, as we look at chapter 15, what I want us to notice is that you and I, we're not God. Jesus is God. And he has shown us that he has all power. By his death, his burial for three days, and by his resurrection. And as you and I come to Christ for salvation, as you and I come to Christ recognizing that Jesus is God, we must place him over our life. We must be faithful to him. We must follow him in all things. And so on this day in which we're gathered, we ask ourselves a question, why does the resurrection matter? How can I know that Jesus truly is God? And what are the implications of the fact that Jesus is God to you and I today? And so as we go through 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to use the acrostic HOPE. And as we look at these four different things, which we see, it's going to help us to see why the resurrection matters to you. First of all, we look at the letter H, and that brings us to the word hope. Well, hope is a whole thing. The letter H brings us to the historical nature of Christianity, the historical nature of our faith. And as you read there in chapter 15, 1 through 4, you see that Christianity is real. It is absolutely true. Now, what is it that Paul is trying to get across as he writes this passage, as he writes this verse, these verses to you and I today? First of all, he says, we know that Christ died and was resurrected because you see it in your Bible. Scripture teaches that the Messiah that the Son of God would come to this world, that he would give up his body, he would die upon the cross for sin, and that he would be resurrected. Now, of course, we don't have time today, but Jesus fulfilled well over 300 prophecies through his lifetime. 
And as you look at Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, as you look in Isaiah chapter 53, as you look in Psalm 22 and Psalm 24, you see over and over the prophecies, the scriptures which teach us that Christ would die and he would be resurrected. No one else ever has fulfilled these scriptures. Muhammad does not fit in what the Bible teaches we need in the Savior. Uh, Joseph Smith does not fit. Mary Baker Eddy does not fit in what we need as a Savior. And as you and I scan over every religion in this world and every holy man in this world and every religious person in this world, nobody fits what the Bible teaches except Jesus and him crucified. But as we look closely at this and as we begin to explore, there's a lot of people who have a lot of different ideas about, uh, you know, what happened with Jesus? Is this something that I should base my faith upon? Is this something that I can be absolutely confident to know that Jesus died, was buried, and was raised on that Sunday almost 2,000 years ago? Well, some of the common arguments, many of them from the 1800s back in Germany by different scholars, have been supposed. And one thing that you'll hear many times today is, well, you know Jesus, uh, you know, we don't know if he's any more real than Thor or Achilles. We don't know if he's any more real than Apollos. He's just a mythological character which we cannot be certain about, and we don't even know if he ever existed. And we could spend time today going through, through, through many of the earlier writers, Josephus and other writers who did not believe in Jesus, Plato the Younger, and we could see where even pagans recognized that Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected on the third day of that time. But as you and I look closely at Western civilization, we see that the world was absolutely changed after 30 A.D., and we see in the following centuries that something happened. Imagine you're at a pond. Imagine you're at the lake. And as you look up, you begin to see ripples. And those ripples are going out. You know that either a fish has hit the surface of the water, a rock has been thrown into the water. Something happened by the evidence of everything else that's around. In Acts chapter 17, looking at verse 6, we see over in Europe, the people bring Jason into the judgment. Paul is already gone, and so they're looking for somebody. And they bring him in, and they say, we need to punish these people because Christianity is here, and it is absolutely turning the world upside down. Christianity raises a lot of the way in which culture treats women. Christianity raises the morals of the people who are around. And anywhere where you look where Christianity has been established, you see that ripple effect. You see that effect that Christ has come, was buried, and was raised on that third day. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23, Paul writes as he opens up that book of Colossians, talking about how that gospel, when it's preached to the entire world, makes a difference. A person who tells you today that they don't believe that Jesus was ever resurrected is not a very good historian. A person who tells you that Jesus is a myth equal to Superman or Batman or whoever else has not studied Western civilization and the transformation and change in the Roman Empire and the empires which have followed after that. We know that there was a Jesus of Nazareth. We know that he operated through the Roman region of Judea. We know that he was put to death. We know that he was resurrected by the lives which have been lived ever since. We can be confident in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Some people say, well, yes, okay, there was a Jesus. But what happened was when they hung him on the cross, he he passed out. He fainted. Loss of blood, difficult to breathe. He fainted. And of course, when they placed him in the tomb, he woke up the next day and he was good to go and he just ran off. That's what happened, they say. And yet, when you begin reading in scripture, you see that cannot be true. In Mark chapter 14, 44 through 45, we see these Roman soldiers who killed people every day. They knew what they were doing. Saul Jesus 
<coughs> and they wished to confirm that he was dead. And so they put a spear up into his side, all the way to his heart. And water and blood flowed forth, showing that this man had died of a broken heart. Showing that this man was dead. As a matter of fact, when the Sabbath was coming and they were in a hurry to make sure that everybody was dead, they broke the legs of the thieves on the left and the right. But they realized Jesus already being dead, they fulfilled prophecy without them even knowing it, that not a bone of Jesus would be broken. And so we know that Jesus died. Some people say, well, you know, maybe the women didn't know which tomb to go to. And I've seen some people who have brought this out in the commentary who truly believe it. And they'll say, you know, these people were in grief. And so when they came back on that first day of the week, they went to the wrong tomb. It was open. It was there. And they thought, well, Jesus must have been resurrected because there's nobody in this tomb. As you think about that, remember whose tomb this was. Joseph of Arimathea. And this is not a graveyard like you and I would have a graveyard where everything is lined right up and you might not know without looking at the gravestones who's buried where. This was a brand new tomb of a very, very wealthy man. It was a tomb big enough to roll the stone in front of. A wealthy man is going to know where this kind of investment has been placed. As you look a little bit later in John chapter 20, verses 3 through 9, passage we oftentimes make fun of today because John makes sure that Christians for generation after generation know that John could run faster than Peter. Proof that a man wrote that, right? When John chapter 20, 3 through 9, they go to the very same tomb and they look within it. And so we know that the tomb was correct, that place was correct, that these people were not just dumb. Number three... Four, five, somewhere. Grave robbers. Somebody stole the body. Imagine if you stole this body, how much money you could make having the body of Jesus. And yet we see in Matthew 27, 65 and 66, that there was a Roman guard. There was a seal placed over this tomb, over this stone. Somebody could not come in and steal that body without overcoming a squad of Roman soldiers. What about the apostles? Could they have stolen the body? You know, they might be embarrassed that their master had just been put to death. They may have heard about a resurrection of his teaching, and so they say, well, okay, we'll just steal the body, and that'll take away the embarrassment which Jesus would have gone through, the embarrassment that we have of being disciples of a false prophet. Well, each one of those apostles died as a martyr, except John, because of the faith in which they had. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 2, James, the brother of John, lost his head, standing up for this faith. A person might lie, but they're not going to give up their lives for a lie. One wouldn't imagine 12. Imagine 120 disciples there on that first day. Imagine the thousands upon thousands upon thousands who have surrendered their jobs, surrendered their families, surrendered their lives for the sake of the cross. What about those evil Jewish rulers? Could they have stolen the body? You know, they're so angry at Jesus. They may have wanted to abuse the body as well. And they may have been afraid of what would happen because they heard that he'd be resurrected on that third day. And so they took the body. Well, that wouldn't have worked because once again, there's a Roman guard. That wouldn't have worked because in the middle of Acts chapter 2, when Peter is preaching that you took this Jesus with lawless hands and crucified him and he is resurrected, they surely would have produced the body because it would have kept their money. It would have kept their position. It would have kept their power. It would have kept their reputation. They would have done anything that they could to be able to discredit Christianity. And yet, they never could. Now, that's a neat little history lesson, a little bit of a logic lesson that we look at there in verses 1 through 7. But why does it matter? It matters because if Jesus died upon the cross... If Jesus 
was buried and if Jesus rose, and if that's a matter of history, then in reality you and I must make a decision. You and I this day face God eye to eye. We see Jesus face to face in a sense, and we must determine what our reaction should be. This is not mythology. This is not made up stories. This is not play pretend going to church. This is a reality which is facing my soul and your soul as well. And the question is, what will my reaction be to the resurrected Christ? And what will your reaction be to the resurrected Christ? Going across our acrostic, we see not only is the resurrection of Christ historical, but the resurrection of Christ is a great opportunity for you and I today. It's the opportunity of forgiveness. It's the opportunity of what Christianity is about, which is giving you an avenue of being with the Lord forever. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Jesus. Looking there in verse 14, notice what Paul freely admits. He says, you know, if Christ is not risen, my preaching, the scriptures are empty. There's no sense in us having church. There's no sense in us reading our Bibles. If Christ is not resurrected, there is no sense in us spending our time every Sunday and every Wednesday in church, there's no sense in us spending our time in serving one another. It's empty if Christ is not risen. Look there in verse 17. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. Your faith is worthless because you are still in your sin. Good works, they don't erase sin. Sincerity does not erase sin. Being religious and doing good things does not erase sin. The only thing that erases sin is the blood of Christ, and the only reason why the blood of Christ would matter is if He is the perfect Lamb of God, John 1, and if He is resurrected. And so if you determine today not to believe in a resurrection, then you're in sin, you're lost, and there's nothing that you can do to relieve that guilt and relieve that sin which is there. You see, without Jesus' resurrection, there is no gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, looking again, 1 through 4, the whole thing, the crux of the entire matter, revolve around <coughs> the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. If there is no resurrection, then according to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, there's no mediator. 1 Timothy 2 and 5 tells us there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. In Christ's resurrection, he has placed himself between us and God. He is the mediator. He is the thoroughfare. And if there is no resurrection, if Christ is not raised, then you and I have no avenue to God. You and I have no avenue to salvation. You and I have no avenue to eternal life. You and I, we are lost in sin. If there is no resurrection, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 14 tells us there is no hope. There is no hope. Let Paul explain that a little bit more fully as we look at that Thessalonian passage. In that passage, Paul says, Brethren, I don't want you to mourn as those who have no hope. For as we know that Christ was resurrected, we also know that he shall return and take those with him who have died and us who will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and we will be with the Lord forever. If there is no resurrection, our life when it ends in the graveyard is a period. It's over. And we're no different than an animal no different than a plant, no different than everything else in this world which has come to an end when the heart stops beating and the lungs stop breathing. 
Don't be a person who has no hope. As a Christian, you can stand at the grave of a loved one and have hope. As a Christian, you can face your own mortality and know there's something beyond. And know that there's something better. And know that we serve, Romans 15, 13, the God of all hope. It fascinates me how people can survive in this world not believing in the resurrection. It horrifies me that so many people in this world have no hope. That they don't realize that God will call both the good and the evil on that last day in John chapter 8, 24. That God will call us all and we will meet Him in the air. And thus we shall be forever with Him. Hope. Opportunity to be with Jesus. Opportunity for forgiveness. Without the resurrection, there is no forgiveness of sin. Number three, as we look at this letter P, we see the power, the power of God. In Mark chapter 2, this is me going off in a little different direction here. Mark chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, you see an interesting passage. Uh, Jesus is in a house and he's preaching and it gets so crowded that, you know, nobody can even walk around. It's claustrophobic in there. And he's preaching and everybody wants to hear him and everybody wants to be with him. And he is telling them the gospel. He's just begun his ministry. Well, there's some friends. And they're friends of someone who's paralyzed. And they know if they get this paralyzed man, this man who can't walk, to Jesus, Jesus will heal him, right? You've heard this. And so, of course, they can't make it in the door. They can't make it in the window. And so they go up on top of the house and they dig through the roof. And they lower their friend down right on top of Jesus. Can you imagine what everybody thought about this? Can you imagine what the homeowner thought about this? Jesus sees this man being lowered by his friends. And as he looks at it, he sees an opportunity for a lesson. And you remember what he says, right? He looks at this man who is paralyzed and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven you. That's not where people expected him to go, right? Son, your sins are forgiven you. Of course, the Pharisees and other people, they're like, oh, no, 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 only God forgives sins. Who is this guy thinking he has the power to forgive sin? And Jesus, reading their hearts, says, to show you that I have the power to forgive sin, let me show you something else. Young man, stand up and walk. The man suddenly had power in his legs, and he stood up and he walked. And so Jesus showed to these people that he had the power to forgive sin by healing this man who had been paralyzed. Now God is much kinder to us than he was to those people in that building. First of all, it's not that crowded in here. We have a full building, but it's not that crowded, right? But more so, Jesus has given us a greater, a greater sign. Jesus can forgive my sin. Even the terrible things that I do and think, Jesus can forgive them. And you may be looking at your life and you'd say, okay, preacher, you know, uh, yeah, God forgives good people, but if you knew what was in my heart, if you knew my past, if you knew how I'd been living, there would be some questions. God shows you that he has the power to forgive sin by his resurrection from the grave. By his resurrection, which is there. Look there in verse 26. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26. And of course, we could look at the context all around there, but we see right there the last enemy, the greatest enemy that Christ has destroyed is death. You ever play video games? A lot of guys, a lot of girls love video games. And you start on that level one, you get to level two and level three, 
And if you're dumb like me and you buy the free game or just get the free game, suddenly you have to start paying money to get to the next level. But you go on and go on and go on to this point and that point, and you get to the end, and here is the greatest fighter. Here is the greatest uh, obstacle which stands before you. What, Jesus? The last enemy which he faced is death. Now, why is death an enemy? The word that we find in Scripture for death, in the Greek, is thanatos, and what it means literally is separation. It's a separation from the body and the spirit. It's a separation from that person and those people who love them. It's that separation of us when we go to the next world, when we go to be with Jesus. There's a weird thing that I do. It's maybe an interesting thing which I do. I have close people in my life who have passed on to the next world. And what I've always done is on my phone, I I never delete anything from my phone hardly, but especially on voicemail. And there are times where when I'm missing my dad or my sister or somebody I love, I'll go through and I'll find their number on my voicemail and I'll push it and I hear their voice. Now it's usually my dad saying, son, pick up your phone. Not exactly the most favorite thing I want him to say, but it is his voice. You see, he's separated. And for the most part, I don't get to be with him any longer. Death is the greatest enemy which we face. And Jesus destroyed death. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about how Jesus is the first fruit. The first thing that you pull off the tree, the first thing that you pull off the vine, which shows that other fruit is coming. And what it means to say that Jesus is the first fruit is that you and I will follow Jesus in the resurrection. And we will once again be with those whom we love. We will once again be able to hear the voice and see the face of those saints who have gone on before. Jesus is too powerful. For death to hold him in. Jesus is too powerful for death to separate him from those whom he loves. Think about for a second who it is that killed Jesus. Who is it that killed Jesus? Was it the Jews? You know, the Jews, many of the leaders hated him because he was taking away their power, taking away their prestige. He seemed to be a smarter and greater rabbi than they. And so they threw Jesus to the Romans and said, crucify, crucify, crucify. Did the Jews kill Jesus? No. They didn't. Did the Romans kill Jesus? They're the ones who were in charge. They had that second trial. Pilate washed his hands and said, you can have him. And he was crucified by Roman soldiers upon a Roman form of execution. Did the Romans kill Jesus? No. Believe it or not, they didn't. Who killed Jesus? In John chapter 10, looking there, John chapter 10, in verse 18, notice what Jesus says. He says, no one takes my life. No one is going to kill me, but I voluntarily lay down my life and then I will pick it up once again. In other words, Jesus says, listen, I'm so powerful that Pilate's going to beg the people, don't make me do this. I'm so powerful, he's going to do it. I'm so powerful that... On the Sunday in which I walk into Jerusalem and people are praising me, that in a week they will be handing me over. Jesus voluntarily laid down his life. He gave himself up for us to show us the way, to redeem us from sin, to make us to be with him forever. The last letter, letter E. And as you and I think about the resurrection and why it matters, it matters because of eternity. You see, the head of grain falls to the ground, 
and it germinates and it comes up something totally different. We were made corruptible. We shall be made incorruptible. We were sown in mortality, but we shall be raised to be immortal. Notice verse 51 and 52 of 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. The twinkling of an eye at that last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and we shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. What are we going to look like in heaven? You ever think about that? Do I really got to wear a skirt and lay on a cloud and play a harp? Am I going to have wings? Am I going to glow? What are we going to look like in heaven? I had a guy many years ago, we were talking about the bodily resurrection, and he said, hey, listen, when you resurrect, when God resurrects me, I would rather have the 22-year-old version of Bob, that was his name, I want the 22-year-old version of Bob instead of the 80-year-old. I want a lot more hair and a lot less belly. And I told him I'm not the short order cook for God, you know. I can't tell God, hey, leave his hair on, take his hair off. But he said, I want to know, is God going to bring me as a 20-year-old or is God going to bring me as the 80-year-old? Is God going to bring me as a person with a hurt back or is God going to bring me when I was, you know, still playing football? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, John begins to explain some of this. He says, you know, on that last day, we have no idea what our body's going to look like. We have not yet imagined what we're going to be in heaven. But he says, let me tell you this. Our bodies are going to look just like Jesus. Our body, what we exist in, will be just like what the Lord is. And that's an interesting thought as you go through and you begin to... Uh, Roll that around in your mind and think about it for a little bit. But what we do know for certain is that our bodies will be changed. What we do know for certain is that the decisions that you make today over these short years you're here upon this earth will affect you for eternity, will affect you forever. Your decision determines your destiny. Your decisions determine your destiny. Now let's go to our last slide here. And what this is, is a very simple concept which you've heard over and over and over. Why does a resurrection matter? And how do I apply myself to the resurrection of the Lord? As you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you see verse 1 through 3, Jesus died. You see there in verse 4 that he was buried. And we see in verse 4 that he rose again. On that third day. Now we also see in Romans 6 the process that you and I go through to contact, to become into connection with the blood of Jesus Christ. You need to understand the Word of God, right? Romans 10 17. You need to be a person of faith, Hebrews 11 6. You need to change your life living for Jesus, Romans 12 and verse 2. You need to confess to others the name of Jesus, not just on the day in which you're saved, but for the rest of your life. But we come into contact with Jesus, with his saving blood and his resurrection on the day that you and I are baptized. Baptism clothes us, covers us in Christ, Galatians 3, 27. Baptism washes away sin, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Baptism and repentance together bring forth, uh, as we call upon the name of the Lord, bring forth the removal of sin, Acts 22 and verse 16, and Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. But Romans 6, 3 and 4 tells us that we die to our sins, that we're buried in Christ, and that we are raised to walk in newness of life. What does a resurrection mean to us today? It means that someone loved you, Romans 5, 8, even when you're a sinner, someone loved you enough to give themselves up so that you can have hope. It means that there is an opportunity for you to be a New Testament Christian, to live forever with God. And it means that you've begun a relationship which will exist not only here upon this earth, but for all eternity. 
We ask ourselves today, what does a resurrection matter? And let me tell you, it means everything. It's the change of our history and culture. It's the change of the powerful church, Daniel 2.44, which shall consume every kingdom. And it's the change of every single saint making the decision that Jesus is truly God. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. That's our, that passage we'll close with. Philippians chapter 2, 9 through 11. Remember Philippians 2, 5, you know, have your attitude, same as that, Christ Jesus. He gave himself up, died upon the cross. Remember that? As you get to verse 9 through 11, it says, And God raised Jesus. And he gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and every tongue shall confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every one of us, either in this life, will admit that Christ is God and we'll follow him into salvation. Or, at the end, when we're condemned and doomed, we'll make the same confession. What's a resurrection matter? It matters everything. Let's be sure that we're right with God today.